Hi, it's me. Today, I'm going to be beating Mirror Dungeon 3 normal during the Blade Lineage event using only Pride skills. I've done one video like this in the past using only Gloom, where I go over the reasons for both making this challenge as well as its rules, so go watch that video if you want a refresher in greater detail. To summarize better though, the rules are, you are only allowed to generate resources of the selected sin affinity, in this case Pride, but you are allowed to spend resources if you corrode your ego. All IDs you use must be at uptie 4 in order to prevent me from using defensive skills that have no affinity. You must only use ego gifts that have a matching sin affinity, and no healing at rest stops or shops or from any effect outside of battle. Those were the four original rules, but from now on, when I do this challenge in the future, I will no longer allow resetting in any situation, even at the last boss. I realized that resetting against Brazen Bull in the last video so I could optimally use Rhymeshank was a bit cheap, and a few people did point that out in the comments, so I shan't be doing the same thing this time around. Pride only has the most IDs that are possible to be used in one of these runs, at a whopping 15 available IDs which can be used. Well, technically 13, but I'll talk about the exceptions later. The problem is that the majority of these IDs are stuck with their skill 1 defense skill, which isn't great most of the time. Pequod Yi Sang, Base Faust, Blade Lineage Dawn, W Corp Hong Lu, Base Sinclair, and Sing Otis all fall into this category of not being able to hit very hard at all and having few useful support options. Blade Lineage Dawn can help get poise for the team, but she's just not needed for that. W Corp Hong Lu and Pequod Yi Sang are just objectively worse than their alternatives, though W Corp Hong Lu does make Wrist Guards a viable choice. And Sync Otis is unique because she's actually a really good defensive option, but there's just a better choice. Base Faust and Base Sinclair are both important because you can actually use them alongside a full six-person team. While they're individually very unimpressive, I made sure to have them both at Uptie 4 in case somebody was killed this run, like how I had to use Base Yi Sang in the Gloom run. Blade Lineage Otis is usable, but like the IDs that only have their skill 1, there's just an objectively better choice. I'm willing to bet that even Sync Otis is better, despite the lower damage, just because of having a super strong evade. And lastly, uh, and Sinclair exists, I guess. There are two big exceptions to this challenge that I need to talk about here, because if I don't, I know people will ask, why didn't you just bring this ID? And those choices are Blade Lineage Merceau and Pequod Ishmael. Pequod Ishmael seems like she'd be an obvious choice since her pride skill gives an additional attack to your team, however when it comes to assist attack you also generate the resource of the new attack. There actually are enough IDs that I could have brought her with only other IDs that had their skill 1, but building the team around that is awkward. If I brought her with the team that I wanted to, she would have been stuck using her guard the entire run, and while passive SP healing is nice, it wouldn't exactly be the best when it comes to planning for a best case scenario. Blade Lineage Merceau breaks the rules of the challenge by having a Wrath skill 3 and no Pride defense skill. Even if you lose a clash with Yield My Flesh, you still get a Wrath resource, so if I ever had two skill 3s in the same slot, I would be forced to restart the fight. Now, if you're willing to bend the rules a little, you could actually bring him at uptie 2, and that might genuinely be optimal for this run, but I can't undo an uptie, so it wasn't going to be an option for me. This leaves me with exactly six IDs that I can bring within this challenge, and they are all definitely the best options I had available to me. Let's go over them in deployment order. The most obvious choice for this run is Magic Bullet Otis. She's the only ID available in any of these runs that has two attack skills that she can use. The first of these, Detonate Magic Bullet, is a very solid option for clashing and damage, even if Dark Flame doesn't do much for this run. Combined with her defense skill, the price of a bullet, I could gain a lot of magic bullet very quickly at very little SP cost. While I'm not using Ego in this run, magic bullet fire may as well be an Ego on its own. I just need to be careful not to use it if I'm going to drop below 10 SP so I don't accidentally nuke my own team. Her SP was a lot easier to manage than with Reindeer Ishmael in the last challenge run. While her passive was technically able to be activated, it really didn't matter at all for the purposes of this run. Sync Association Dawn is my second choice may seem a bit strange, but Salut is without a doubt the best clashing skill available. Going into this run, I was planning to get as many of this skill from the shop as I could due to how nice it actually is. Her passive also makes it e much easier to deal high amounts of pierce damage. Her evade is also very solid, and in human fights gives me a much better chance at winning clashes since it lowers the enemy SP for some reason. 
She's just a very solid defensive choice for this run. Blade Lineage Yi Sang was the most obvious choice after Magic Bullet Otis, and in retrospect, he should have been in deployment slot too. Striker's stance doesn't immediately seem impressive due to being a skill 1, but once you factor in the really consistent 3 coin power from his passive, it consistently becomes a good option to clash. When it comes to damage, his best skill is actually his counter, which regularly hit for over 100 damage even against enemies who weren't weak to it. The big issue was just going to be keeping his HP in a safe range. Slot 4 was occupied by Muller Boatworks Ishmael, who unfortunately does not have as good of a skill 1 as Yi Sang does. What she does have, however, is the best evade in the game, having a floor of 10 for some reason. While it doesn't hit the 15 threshold that is so important for defensive characters, she was incredibly reliable due to ha not having to rely on her SP in order to avoid taking damage. And it wasn't like her damage was bad, even if the one sinking she could inflict didn't end up mattering too much. In slot 5, we have Hook Office Hong Lu, whose role was exclusively found in his evade in skill 3. He can do really good damage to most enemies in the game, but the problem is that I already had two other skills that I would want to grab in shops. In retrospect, he should have been in slot 6. Thanks to his evade giving haste, whenever I used Rampage, he basically always could gain the plus 1 coin power from his effects, so it's not like he wasn't reliable. Lastly, we have Kurokumo Rodian, who you would expect to be an obvious choice for this run anyways. Sky Clearing Cut is a very high clashing and damaging skill, and with 5 plus voice, you can use it as a counter. Except that the passive requires you to own less resources in order to activate, meaning I couldn't actually use her in the smart way. As a result, her counter was not as good as it should have been. That being said, if I could replace one of Rodia's skills in the shop for another sky clearing cut, I could always do so thanks to its insane damage and utility. When it comes to support passives, there's actually a few good ones this time around. Base Faust support passive is a liar and actually inflicts offense level down next turn, and since it's always active for this run, it's actually a genuinely good effect to have. Blade Lineage Merceau's extra crit damage is also really significant for helping this team because, as you'll see shortly, about 50% of all of my attacks are crits in this run anyways. The less useful support passives come from Pirate Gregor, Base Sinclair, and LCC Ryoshu. Pirate Gregor's support passive is nice, but the unit with the highest poise was usually Yi Sang, who had no pierce damage, so it didn't matter too much. Base Sinclair's passive only activates on ally death, and even then, one attack power-up wasn't that big of a deal. And while LCCB Ryoshu's passive would be an auto-win if I managed to activate it, I don't think I ever got to 7 Magic Bullet on Otis, even in the longer fights of this run. There are a lot of useful Ego Gifts that Pride can take advantage of, and unlike the last run I did, I actually have two Gifts that I can start with. The first and most important gift for the entire run is Nebulizer, which guarantees 8 poise and 8 poise count at the start of combat once it is upgraded to level 3. This gift by itself basically guarantees that I have mostly crits on every sinner by the third turn of battle, upping my damage output by a good amount. The other gift in the poise category that I could start with is the Broken Blade, thanks to the Blade Lineage event. Dealing a small amount of additional pride damage on crit really doesn't matter too much, but it was something I could actually use, so I figured that starting with it would be better than waiting to get it at a random event. There are better starting gifts for me to go for if I wanted to play around with the random category, specifically Prejudice would be the target for my only healing for the entire run, but I prefer being able to start these runs consistently instead of taking 20 minutes for the correct starting gift. The big new addition this time around was that of enemies from Kurakumo Clan. While not super dangerous in terms of what attacks they use normally, my inability to avoid fighting at least some of them for the run meant that I would be taking significant unavoidable bleed damage the entire run. Not only that, but I had a couple IDs that were weak to slash damage this time around, so I needed healing as quickly as I could get there. The first shop took a few resets, but I did eventually get Prejudice to show up. During the Gloom run, I was unable to get my only option for healing in Grey Coat, and it nearly cost me the run so I needed to make sure that I had the ability to heal as soon as possible. Prejudice can only heal one person per turn, and since it heals based on your missing HP, it is a lot less consistent than other healing gifts. The heal at the start of the fight is also pretty nice, but it only heals one party member still. I also was able to get one more of Otis's skill 2 in this shop. While getting a skill 3 for either Don or Rodeo would typically be better, there was unfortunately no way for me to guarantee that I would see them, so it's better to just take the first skill that you know you can get when it comes up. 
I had a quite a bit of cost left over after finding Prejudice, so it was worth re-rolling a couple more times in the hopes that Special Contractor Late Bloomer's Tattoo, the strongest non-healing gifts that I had left to find, would show up. I had skipped Wrist Guards already because I can't activate it, and the odds of finding something else was pretty... So a lot of people don't know that Artistic Sense is a pride gift. Well, in its current state, this gift does nothing for me. Once it hits tier 3, it is effectively just a 50% damage boost to all attacks for the purposes of this run. I was not expecting to see it at all, but I would be a fool to pass it up, so this is where the rest of my cost went. My first floor boss ended up being the tearful version of Mariel and his goons. By the way, does anyone else seriously remember this fight from Kanto 4? He really does appear there, right before Shock Centipede. The worst first bosses you can encounter are Smee and Nico, and even though this specific fight isn't too bad, Rodia loses quite a bit of HP thanks to being weak to blunt. This challenge really doesn't start to pick up until the third floor boss most of the time from all of my attempts at it so far. I couldn't pick any of the gifts from the end of fight rewards, so I had to refuse and the enemies got the buff that makes them inflict more bleed with skills, which makes Kurakumo Clan a bit scarier on average. My Floor 2 layout was a bit unlucky, forcing me to do an event Peccatulum fight followed by a guaranteed challenge battle in order to reach the rest stop to upgrade my gifts. The event Peccatula aren't quite as dangerous as the normal ones, since they have defense skills that can be ignored, but this fight wanted to be mean to me for some reason, and I lost a few clashes on turn 2 to random chance. This was actually the second longest fight in the entire run, since I had to try and balance the damage I took to not suffer too much. Ultimately, I got through with a few additional scrapes thanks to the healing from Prejudice. The challenge fight afterwards wasn't super noticeable. Challenge fights usually aren't too troublesome until floor 4, since that's when T-Corp in the middle start to spawn, but Rodia did actually end up getting staggered here. Still, this gives me a good chance to talk about the biggest threat introduced to these runs, June. His counter is insanely powerful, and since your damage is a bit inconsistent, staggering him before he uses it is not going to be an easy task. I made sure to avoid event challenge fights as often as I possibly could, and thankfully never had to deal with it. This challenge fight also gave me tomorrow's fortune, and while I can take it, it isn't likely to help me too much to get better gifts. That being said, all the gifts that don't provide much benefit are useful in being able to be sold for high amounts of cost. At this first rest stop, I'm sure to max out both Nebulizer and Artistic Sense, which I barely have enough cost to do by this point in the run. Without needing to do a Peccatula and a challenge fight, I would have had to rely on random chance in order to fully upgrade both. After a quick fight against Kurakuma Clan that was pretty uneventful, I reached the second floor boss, Piss Shoes. Yeah, this fight is piss easy, even under this challenge. They're also weak to pride. There really isn't much to say about them, so let's move on to floor 3. I was once again unable to choose a gift after the last boss, and unfortunately the game decided to give the enemies 0.1 resistance boost to everything except Gloom, so I would have to deal with slightly reduced damage from here on out. I actually was able to get another sky clearing cut on Rodia in this run's second shot, which basically doubles her consistency. She deals high enough damage that it's worth investing in, though I did debate re-rolling and try to get more skill 2s on Otis. Every single fight on this floor except for the one fight I had against Kurakumo Clan right before the boss was against K-Corp. K-Corp is not difficult, even when the Excision staff are present, but they do eat up a lot of time overall and can deal decent damage if they hit you. They did not hit me, enough to make me struggle at all, and neither did Kurakumo Clan. I don't think I've had a less eventful Floor 3 when trying this challenge before, and I've lost runs on Floor 3 when attempting other runs in the past. It was really strange. I didn't end up having any other gifts to upgrade on Floor 3, so the rest stop also didn't end up helping. So it was on to the boss fight. Headless Ichthys was the Floor 3 boss that I was graced with this time around. Under normal circumstances, this fight is not too hard, but my lack of consistent clashing and the fact that even my evades couldn't save me from specific skills meant I needed to be a lot more careful in how I approached this fight. In addition, I wasn't going to be able to stagger the body before it used Blood Cannon on turn 3, but that was okay. I could just have Rodia beat Blood Cannon using Sky Clearing Cut and be fine.
I've complained about the 5% chance to land tails in this game before, but this is legitimately the worst moment for it to have kicked in. This hit staggered Rodia, and made it so that Ishmael was hit by the second blood cannon, inflicting her with 27 bleed. Not only that, but this was right after Don failed an evade and lost 100 HP to Tail Whip. On the plus side, my big squishy fish brother will never use Blood Cannon again after this turn, so my biggest danger was now Tail Whip. The biggest danger now was actually my evades, just not being strong enough to avoid Body Press and Tail Whip, but all things considered I got pretty lucky for the rest of the fight. I focused my best attacks against the right leg and tried to let Yi Sang counter as much as possible to maximize my damage output, and since this fight is so slow in this challenge, Prejudice was able to heal back most of the HP I had lost from those first two unlucky turns. Even though I got pretty unlucky, this was genuinely one of my favorite fights that I've done in this game for quite some time. It's super satisfying to beat a fight that would generally be pretty tough under rules like these, and I just really like Headless Ichthys' design personally. He's a good boy, I like him. Once again, I was unable to select an Ego Gift from the boss fight, and the game gave enemies the boost that increases their power by one in a clash, genuinely the worst possible buff they could have gotten. The final floor did not start off on a good foot. Ishmael immediately lost a clash against a talisman enemy, causing her to get staggered and losing her about 90 HP total after one heal from Prejudice. The fight ended pretty quick after, but next was Kurokumo Clan, where she proceeded to once again immediately lose a clash, leaving her at low HP after becoming staggered for a turn. Not only that, but Don failed an evade and became staggered, then Ishmael failed another clash, becoming staggered again, and being left with only 11 HP and enough bleed to kill her if not for Prejudice's healing effects. While I managed to get through the rest of this fight without losing anybody, it was starting to look very similar to the last run in terms of how much damage I was taking. I had an unavoidable abnormality event on this floor as well, but thankfully it was the Dream Devouring Silt current event. Endorphin Kit is against the rules, but Fluorescent Lamp, while not at all useful and literally impossible to activate without Base Sinclair being in an active party slot, is thankfully a pride gift, so I was able to take that as a cash injection for the upcoming final shot. The next three fights, one standard, one Pekatula, and one challenge, didn't end up being super dangerous. I lost the occasional evade with Hong Lu, but aside from that, I was mostly able to use these fights to refill my HP using Prejudice. That said, I could never get it maxed out due to having four party members who were sitting at around 60% max HP, so I was still a little wanting for HP. The Pekatula fight actually rewarded me with lowest star for my efforts, which would have been nicer earlier in the run so that I could upgrade it. This was recorded before a guaranteed rest stop was placed at the end of Floor 4, but as it was now, it provided basically no bonus for me. The challenge fight was against the Chicken Head K Corp guys who were no trouble and gave me no useful gifts. I was now at the final preparation point before the end boss. During this event, you always had a choice. Take the semi-random boss like usual, or guarantee a fight with Bamboo Hatted Kim. My boss was weak to a combination of Pierce and Gloom, which meant either the Town Robot, Drifting Fox, or Shock Centipede. Kikui is really easy, and I was fairly conf confident that I could beat Drifting Fox, but Shock Centipede, that accursed one-third chance, is an absolute beast just like Brazen Bull is. With my current setup, and with any setup really, it would be an uphill climb, and not allowing myself to restart means that any bad RNG or poor turn meant I would almost certainly lose the run. That being said, Bamboo-Headed Kim is also a beast in a different way. On the fourth turn of battle, he's guaranteed to use a skill that gives him 200 shield, is unbeatable in a clash without 7 bullets, something that wouldn't be possible for me to do by then, and also he's just really dangerous in general if he lands a hit. Even though he's weak to pride, doing enough damage to stagger him wasn't going to be easy. Plus, Don's Evade was going to slowly cause Kim to become more dangerous to clash with. The final shop immediately gave me another sky clearing cut, which is always appreciated, so I grabbed it immediately. I had a thousand cost and I needed to use it to get a, as big of an advantage as possible. One refresh later gave me Late Bloomer's Tattoo. It's genuinely a great gift, since it helps with my damage and clash power slightly, so I was glad to see it, but it wasn't going to help too much overall. I needed something more. I needed... Special Contract. This was the last true piece of the puzzle for this team. Special Contract would have made Headless Ichthys go down infinitely easier, 
and it was going to help immensely against this last boss. Prior to this moment, I was unsure if beating Kim would be reasonable, and risking a shock centipede fight was very scary for this team. Broken Compass also showed up here, but I felt like lowering Kim's sanity would be detrimental, so I don't end up taking it. So now it was time to pick my poison. But what fun would it be if, during this Blade Lineage event, I didn't at least try my luck against the Mentor himself? The fight against Kim began with a very solid skill lineup for me, but our damage wasn't looking good enough yet. And I was a fool and didn't allow Yi Sang to counter one of his hits every turn, and instead just made sure to clash to get Kim's sanity up. Prior to entering this fight, I had considered selling Artistic Sense to get a little more money for gifts, but it ended up being helpful for my damage thanks to Dawn's Evade keeping Kim below 0 SP. And honestly, I don't think I would have enough damage without it. The third turn introduces a guaranteed counter that Kim uses, so whoever went first was always going to get hit. Since Hong Lu was the fastest, it was pretty safe to allow him to take a hit from using Rampage, since he wouldn't likely get to attack again during the fight anyhow. The issue is that I barely didn't deal enough damage to stagger during turn 3, meaning I now needed to stagger before his AoE went off. What's worse is that I had no attacking skills going into turn 4, meaning the only sources of damage I had were Rodia and Yi Sang's counters. If both of them landed a crit, that should be just enough to break his shield and cause a stagger. But all I could do was hope that Rodia's 70% crit chance would go in my favor. Yi Sang was already guaranteed to crit, but that second hit would be what mattered the most. I just had to sit... and... Hope. And to my surprise, she had done it. Special Contract ate half of Bamboo Headed Kim's remaining HP, and with five attacking skills lined up, all that was left was to watch my team punch out the remaining 600 HP left on the boss in a single turn. The run was complete after an absolute ass-clenching final turn, and now all that was left was to see the results. I generated a total of 386 pride resources throughout the entire run, just over half of what I ended up generating in the Gloom run. To close this out, I want to quickly admit that pride was always going to be the easiest Mono Sin run available. I mean, Wrath might be a little easier now that we have more burn IDs, but Pride just has the most options and one of the cleanest possible setups you can get. I mentioned earlier that it is actually possible to use Pequod Captain Ishmael in this run, and that's because there are at least five other sinners who have a Pride skill 1 who are legal. Your team would have to look something like this, and honestly, it's a genuinely fun run to do. It's also genuinely a lot harder to complete, since your clashing is not great on team members other than Ishmael and Yi Sang, but it makes wrist guards valuable thanks to W Corp Hong Lu, so that's at least cool. But that's two out of seven Mono Sin runs in the books. I probably won't do another one of these until the next major Mirror Dungeon update comes out, probably Mirror Dungeon 4 normal at this rate. But these have been pretty fun. This one took about half as long to play compared to the Gloom run, and just generally, all of the ones going forward are going to be faster. I'll leave the entire unedited run as a link to an unlisted video in the description in case you want to see it. If you enjoyed this, I'd appreciate if you leave a like on the video and subscribed. If enough people comment for a specific sin to do next, I will do that one when the next Mirror Dungeon update comes out, and hopefully Lust and Envy might not be as bad by that point too. In any case, I hope you have a good rest of your day, and I hope to see you back again for the next one. Peace.